Welcome to Shamba Shape Up. This year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of your favorite TV show. Once again, we have traveled all over East Africa to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need. So they can adapt and make their farms more productive even while the climate changes. We support them to become more productive, get better yields, and increase their income. We meet families and enter their kitchens to explore what we eat, where we get it, and how we can cook it in cleaner, faster, healthier, and cheaper ways. And at the same time, increase family nutrition. We will see how farmers from across the region can benefit from our experts' advice. While also learn from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmers' experiences as they shape up their shambas. Welcome to the Shamba Shape Up Safari. Dear viewers, I'd like to let you know that all the filming you're about to see was done before the outbreak of the coronavirus in Kenya and Tanzania. Hello and welcome to Shamba Shape Up. Today we have something quite special for you. I am going to find out how meat is processed before it's sold on a supermarket counter. Well, see you later, Caro. Later, Tony. Don't be too long. I won't be. So, while Tony contacts our farmer for a shape up, I'm meeting up with Edwin Aziz, a butchery production officer for my special report on meat standards. I want to find out what happens to meat from when it leaves the farmer's shamba to when it arrives at the supermarket meat counter. To help me understand, Edwin is taking me on a tour of all the different stages in meat processing. I must say it's been very interesting to see all the hard work that goes into keeping the meat clean and healthy. Wow, Edwin, yeah. this is so wonderful. Uh, and I must absolutely commend you for one, the cleanliness. I'm impressed. Thanks a lot. Yes. I'll take you back to the routine. Mm -hmm. Number one, meat being sensitive as yes. it is. Yes. You have to observe the cold chain. Yes. When you talk about the cold chain, what do you mean? The cold chain mm -hmm. is maintaining the freshness and the coldness of the meat all the way from the supplier mm -hmm. to the receiving end inside the production area mm -hmm. all the way to the customer's basket. Mm -hmm. So that means right from receiving the meat yes. up to when it ends on the customer's basket. Customer's basket. Yes. Wow. Exactly. All right. So, Edwin showed me how meat is kept cold through the different production stages before being sent for sale to the supermarket. It's called the cold chain. First, the arrivals area. Even as meat arrives from the slaughterhouse, it is already cold as a fridge as it's transported in these refrigerated trucks. Next, the holding area. Here, the meat remains cold as it is hung to improve its flavor and texture. And then the meat processing area. This is the coldest of all. This is where the different cuts of meat are prepared, as well as the sausages and the minced meat too. I'd certainly want to dress up warm if I was a butcher working here. And finally, the dispatch area. This is where the meat is packed, ready for sending out to the stores. It's cold here too. <laughs> but there's a reason for all this cold. The low temperatures stop any harmful bacteria from contaminating the meat. So, it keeps fresh. But then, how long does it take to do all this work? Can it be a problem if the meat stays here too long? We take the shortest time. When ordering meat coming that is frozen, yes. it was slaughtered the previous day, yes. it comes when it's chilled. Mm -hmm. We hold it for one day, do production, mm -hmm. and dispatch on the third day. All right. So there is no meat that is going to stay here past three days? Three days, no. Okay. But I still wanted to know, is the meat kept clean? Nothing comes into contact with the meat. Mm -hmm. The freshness that it came in mm -hmm. and the receiving, the way we are holding it yeah. after production, mm -hmm. is the same freshness that we'll maintain into the displays of our branches. All right. So let's say uh, that the meat has arrived at the customer's plate yes. and maybe there's a problem. Is it possible to like maybe trace where this meat came from? You might have noticed at the receiving end here, yes. any concernment that comes in yeah. from any supplier mm -hmm. is given a batch number. Batch number. Let me show you. Yeah. You see, the yeah. batch number has the description of the, of mm -hmm. the cut, mm -hmm. the day it was product, yeah. the production yeah, was done, third, third, it has the yeah. item code mm -hmm. and the sale by date. Wow. It's only five days to be sold and mm -hmm. the batch number of which, mm -hmm. if anything happens mm -hmm. between the production area mm -hmm. and 
the customer's uh, basket yes. or into the customer's table, mm -hmm. traceability will be easy for us. Be able Not to be only to the plant, yes. all the way to the farmer's mm -hmm. farm. All right. Yes. To the actual cow, that is. Yes. Oh, that is quite impressive. Yeah. This is the normal routine that we have. Mm -hmm. Number one, no preservatives is done. Yeah. No I mean, preservatives. I mean, it's added. good that it's coming from you because most of our farmers have been uh, greatly confused about what's been happening lately. Yeah. Uh, where people see red meat and you're told that they are preservatives. Yeah. As we have shown you, our mm -hmm. process is open. Yes. Nothing has been added, no preservatives, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just fresh as this came in mm -hmm. and uh, still fresh as it goes out. Yeah. So if anything happens, we can hold the company accountable because we have the batch number. Exactly. Well, that was very interesting. Farmers, be sure that you always keep your cows well fed and healthy. As you've seen, meat sold at the market counter can be traced back to your shamba. But now I have to go and meet Tony. And I'm still feeling cold from being inside that processing center. Ooh. Ah, there you are, Caro. Very impressive. Very good reporting. I saw it. I saw it. Well. Mm -hmm. you, you must be cold though. Tony, it was so cold in there. Uh, you're struggling. Ah, don't even talk. You know what they call it? Yes. Keeping the cold chain intact. That means the meat arrives at its point of sale fresh. Impressive. <laughs> but now there's a farmer waiting for us to continue with our shamba shepherd. <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go. You will get warm in the car. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> And here we are. Today we are visiting Burunjoroge and his wife Magdalene. But it's their son Peter who now does most of the work and shows us around the farm. Yes. Hey. Hey, mommy. Hello. Yes. Hello. Good. Now we are here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Show us your shamba. Let's go. Good. All right. Okay, see, see you later. later. Bye. All right. Thank you. Well, this is lovely. Peter's family farm covers around eight acres on the slopes of the lush thicker hills. And it's ideal for growing avocados. I love avocados, Tony. And here's the last season's maize. Time to start planting for the short rains, Caro. Ah, but I think we can help out with the kitchen, Tony. It's very smoky. Peter, yeah. very nice shamba. Yeah, thank you. What yeah. challenges? do you experience in your shamba? Actually, my trees are not producing good fruit. Mm -hmm. They have got some disease. I don't know whether it's a disease or what. My avocados, mm -hmm. they're not doing well. Well, you have an expert and we are going to look at your avocados and yeah. see how we can help. Thank out. you. Uh, we've seen your kitchen. Yeah. What happens there? There's a lot of smoke in the kitchen. My mm -hmm. sister, she's cooking, she's sneezing, mm -hmm. she's coughing. Mm -hmm. I would like you to help me. Tony, yes. do you think yes. you can help with that? Yes. Thank you. Good. So, Thank kindly you. let us get to work because we have a lot to do. Yeah. We'll see you later. Thank you. All okay. right. All right, Peter. Thank you. So, let's pitch the tent and get ready for work. So, for our first job, we are going to meet Bridget Mwangi from Olivado. We want to help Peter with his avocado trees. Avocados are a big business for this farm and they have over 150 trees with each producing around 1,000 fruits and they are organic too, not bad at all. But there is a problem. Some of these trees are showing signs of disease. Peter, you are a great avocado farmer. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. For, for how long have you been planting avocados? I've been planting for 30 years now. That's good. Yeah. And how has the journey been? The journey has not been bad, but now they're not giving good yields. Yeah. yeah. The production is level, low. Is the low. production is low mm -hmm. and the uh, spots. Ah. The spots. Lucky for you, we have Bridget here, an expert on avocados. Yes. <laughs> now, Bridget. Yes. By looking at uh, Peter's avocado, can you spot where the problem is? Yes. Especially <laughs> Tell these spots. Us live along the spots yeah. if you see the like now this branch yeah. there are no enough leaves yeah there are fruits okay some are small yeah some are big yes they are not looking healthy okay then most of the leaves are not green they are pile green yeah so there's a disease we call phytothera cinnamomi okay uh, disease called phytothera cinnamomi yeah. mostly affects the roots so yeah. we most the farmers call it root rot yeah it affects the fruits yeah most of it dies back from the top Okay. Then after some few months, years, yeah. Yeah. so that will die. Mm. Yes. Peter, have you seen that on your crop? Yeah, I've seen it. The, the, the leaves start drying yeah, and from the top, from the top yeah. going down. Yes. Going down. This root rot. Mm -hmm. How serious is it? It's serious because it can affect the other trees because this disease is brought by water. Yeah. If you look at this farm, it's sloppy. So the water, running water, can go down to the other trees and infect the other trees. 
Uh -huh. So it, it can affect all the trees in the farm because it's spread by water. So now, how does a farmer deal with this? I know you're an organic farmer. Yeah. So what you're going to do is just plant a new yeah. tree in yeah. a non-deceased area. Okay. You purchase the seed from a health nursery, which they do the sampling mm -hmm. and they test. So it has to start from the beginning. Yes, because where it's brought the from farmer. the nursery. Yes, where yes. the farmer Where you are getting the seed, yeah. The, the seedling. seedling. Yes. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the most important. Okay. Where should the seedling be planted? Not near the sick tree. What, why? What's the problem with that? Because it's going to be affected again, because of the running water. Yes. So you're not going to plant it near the sick tree. Uh -huh. So you have to look somewhere where there's no sick trees, we plant there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Peter, show us why we can plant a new seedling. Let's go. Let's go. So, Peter has to cut down his diseased avocado, but he can plant a new one, as long as it's not too close to the old deceased tree. And there's a spot already prepared for us. So, to stop the same problem from recurring, we brought Peter a disease-free seedling. It comes from a certified nursery, so Peter can be sure when it grows, there will be no problem with root rot. Now, let's see how best to plant it. This way you've prepared the hole for us. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. How deep is the hole? Two by two. Is, is that correct? Yes. Bridget? Yeah. So, when planting avocados, first dig a hole two feet wide by two feet deep. Separate the topsoil from the bottom soil. Mix the topsoil well with decomposed manure. Add a compound fertilizer such as 2020. Mix 120 grams per tree into your soil mix. Then add the soil mix back into the hole. Once the hole is full, make a small space for the seedling ready to be inserted. Next, cut away the plastic covering from the roots of the seedling. Place the seedling in the small hole you made and farm in some soil around the sides. It's best to plant when it's raining, but if it's not, water the plant well to give it a good start. If you get certified seedlings that are grafted too, then in two and a half to three years, you'll have your first crop of disease-free avocados. If you don't have organic trees and are looking for a chemical control for root rot, get in touch with Aishamba. Peter, Yes. well done. Now, I must warn Caro all about this avocado disease. I know she loves avocados. Ah, Tony, so how's Bite the going? Thora. Caro, Bite of Thora. What is that? Did, did something happen to you out there? It's, it's, it's damaging farmers' avocados. They are getting small avocados and low, low harvest. All right, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Root rot. Oh, I should have said that. Ah. Coming up after the break. How to prepare land for planting maize. And saving time and money cooking with an electric pressure cooker. Welcome back to Shamba Shepa. We are in Thika and we are visiting Burunjoroge and his son Peter. We found out all about meat processing. And how to plant disease-free avocados. But we also want to find out about preparing your land for planting cereals like maize. And how to cook cheaper, cleaner and quicker using an electric pressure cooker. Hey, so no time to waste. Let's get back to work. Back to work. <laughs> Right now, my next job is to help Peter with his maize. We've invited Josfat Musenze from Parfid to demonstrate how to get a bumper harvest following the principles of conservation agriculture. Yes. So, Peter, yes. you harvested maize here. Yeah. Was it a good harvest? No, it was not a good harvest. Why? I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem with the soil or what. I don't know, actually. If he wants to add more production, mm -hmm. he has to do something different. Mm -hmm. So, we need to practice conservation and culture. Yeah. What is conservation agriculture? Conservation agriculture is where we use three principles. One, uh, minimal soil disturbance. Mm. You make a uh, hole where you will plant. And in that hole, you have to break the hard pan. So, the first principle, only dig where you plan to plant. And dig deep enough to break the hard pan. The dense layer of soil that can build up and stop water getting to the roots of the plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then the second principle is crop rotation. Like Peter last Sunday funded me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You do 
with crop rotation. Crop rotation. The next season you plant legume. Why? Yeah. Because the legumes will fix the nitrogen, means will take the nitrogen mm -hmm. and there will be a good crop the means. Yeah. You'll also break the, the suck of the disease. Yes. Then there will be no a lot of infection in the farm. Then the third principle is residue retention. Right. And that's what Josphat is going to demonstrate. How to achieve residue retention. In other words, keeping the soil moist. So, we start by deciding what to do with the stovers left over from last season's harvest. What have you been doing with the stock after harvesting? You have been taking it out all of it and yeah. taking it to the cow. Mm. To the cow. Yeah. Look now. It's like have you two kids. One kid you give food and the other one you are not giving food. Well, that's bad. That's bad. Yeah. Wow. So you have to share. One take the animal and the other one to be, to be left with the left farm. farm. Like now when you take it to the, the cows, yeah. the way it is, yeah. will the cow eat everything? No. No. From the top down here is a bit soft. Mm -hmm. The cow will take it. Mm -hmm. So the other part, just leave it to the farm. So we mm. encourage farmers mm. just to cut, to cut there. Okay. Take this one to the cow. animals. Leave this one to the farm. Uh -huh. So it will just decompose. The hands will come, eat it, make you in your soil. Your soil become better. So that's great. Taking only the tender top half of the maize over and leaving the rest in the field means the cows are kept happy and the soil is protected. Now, Josphat is going to demonstrate how to plant with minimum soil disturbance. The smaller the jembe, the better. Okay. Because we want to maintain the minimum soil disturbance. Okay. Using a jembe means the holes are not too large. Now, to make sure we get the maize planted in a straight line, Josphat is using a rope as a guide with bottle tops every 70 centimeters to indicate how far apart the basins should be dug. The depth should be 15 to 20 centimeters. Why 15 to 20? This is the root zone okay. of the crop. And already at that point, you have already broken the, the hard, the hard pan. pan. Use a biro as a quick guide to make sure you have the correct depth, 20 centimeters, and the correct length too. If you check, this biro is 15 centimeters. Uh -huh. It means this 15, 15, that, then this is five centimeters. Oh. So this gives you 35 cent centimeters, centimeters. centimeters. Oh. So you are short of the precision. Then the width of the basin should be the size of the jembe. So let's recap. Dig planting holes 20 centimeters deep, 35 centimeters long, and around 15 centimeters wide, or the width of a standard jembe. Wow. Those are the, the basins. Mm -hmm. If you look at my jembe, I also saw some measurements. Mm. This is 75 centimeters. Okay. From the line of the, the maze to the next line of the maze should be 75 centimeters. Okay, okay. For the learning, that is spacing we just oh. press it here. Okay. Just bring it down here. We want these residues eh, to remain here. We don't want to remove them from the farm. Okay. Now, Peter. Yes. In the second line also, yeah. you have to dig the lower side. The lower mm -hmm. side. Why? Because once you dig this side, you reduce the space. The space. And we need to get centimeters. centimeters. Mm -hmm. You dig well. Yeah? Your basin here. And remember, the land preparation is done during the dry period. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Okay. Because when it's raining, there's a lot of mud, the soil is thick. Okay. So, Peter, yeah. once we have prepared our land this way, yeah. we are ready for planting. Yeah. Now we move on with the planting. So, that's great. Next year, a bumper harvest. Welcome to Shamba Shep Pubs Q&A. And today, we are very lucky to have in the studio Dr. Mark Hawken and Doris Naitore, a health officer. So, we want to establish what is true or false. Are people living with HIV more likely to get seriously ill? I think it really depends on uh, their immunity. Uh, if you have uh, somebody who uh, is living with HIV, they're not taking uh, antiretrovirals or they're not taking their antiretrovirals uh, uh, regularly, they're likely to be, uh, they're likely to have low immunity and I would say those uh, people are more likely, uh, are more susceptible to, to uh, getting 
uh, COVID infection uh, and are likely to get uh, more severe disease. But for the majority of people living with HIV who uh, are taking their antiretrovirals uh, e every day, uh, their immunity is good, they do not have an increased uh, susceptibility to, to infection and are not more likely to get uh, a severe disease. Will antiretroviral treatment, ART, for HIV stop somebody from getting COVID-19? In uh, the beginning of the pandemic, we were, we were hopeful that uh, antiretrovirals for HIV might be helpful. But uh, as things have moved along, it's, it's clear that uh, antiretrovirals for HIV uh, are, are not helpful for, um, for coronavirus infection. Are antibiotics effective in preventing or treating COVID-19? Taking antibiotics will not help or prevent getting COVID-19. Antibiotics are meant for infections, so if you have COVID-19, you get into the hospital and you're, you're, you'll have the appropriate treatment within the hospital. How can people help to stop stigma relating to COVID-19? What we can do as a society or as a community is to ensure that we do not uh, talk about people who have COVID-19 and for those who are sick to ensure that we visit them, we talk to them and we integrate them back into the community. It's good for you to show love and understanding to families that have been infected and affected by COVID-19. And we want to thank you also for joining us in our today's session of Q&A. So, if you have any questions around COVID-19, get in touch with us. Call or SMS us your question at 0748-153-120. Well, my final task today is to help Peter's sister Dorcas in the kitchen. She uses an open wood fire. Smoke from kitchens is one of the biggest killers of women and children in Africa. So, we want to introduce a family to a much better solution. And not only smoke-free, it's cleaner and cheaper too. Wah! <coughs> this smoke is too much. Time Peter and I rescue Dorcas and take her into the house to meet Agnes, our expert from Jikoni Magic and our wonderful pressure cooker. <sighs> <laughs> that was smoking. Smoking. <laughs> you cook like that every day? That's what we normally do. Smoke throughout. Smoke throughout. Yeah. So now, that kind of cooking using firewood yeah. has its disadvantages. Yes, sir. The main ones are which ones? Health. Yes. And then there's also the cost. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't know. How, how much do you buy your firewood for a meal? 200 will go. 200, 200. Mm. per meal. Mm. Wow. Gideli. Mm. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. This one, um, the pressure cooker, <coughs> is very efficient when it comes to the cost. Mm -hmm. So you'll find making that gideri that you're talking of, mm -hmm. it will cost you on average between 10 to 12 shillings. Mm -hmm. 10 watts of electricity if you're using your tokens, you'll see. Wow. Mm -hmm. True. Then the other thing is, um, advantage of this is the time taken. Mm -hmm. Your gideri, how long do you cook it for? Two to three hours. Thus. Now this one, once it comes to pressure, mm -hmm. it will cook the gideri in 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. 40 minutes? And it will be ready to go. Wow. So yeah. today, what are we cooking? Today we are cooking mudokoi, mm -hmm. made with beans. Mm -hmm. At the far end over there, we have half a kg of yellow beans. Mm -hmm. And we mix it with a quarter kilo of mudokoi. Mm -hmm. And we have soaked that overnight. Mm -hmm. It's important to oh. learn how to soak your food mm -hmm. because it will cut on your cooking time mm -hmm. and it will help you cook okay, efficiently, okay, okay. not okay. costing yeah. you too much. Mm -hmm. So before we start cooking, mm -hmm. let me plug in the energy meter yes. so that you can know exactly how much we're uh, going to be spending. Uh -huh. What's mm -hmm. the first thing we do then? We will start by uh, sauteing our onions. Mm -hmm. We do it with the lid open. We mm -hmm. will not cook with the lid closed because mm -hmm. we will not be cooking the onions mm -hmm. using pressure. Okay. Number five is the function that allows us to cook with the pressure cooker right. open. Mm -hmm. The rest of the functions here mm -hmm. are for cooking under pressure mm -hmm. when the lid is on. Mm -hmm. We are going to add our cooking oil. Yes, so we will put in our onions. Mm -hmm. 
salt. We will throw in some salt. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I will add the garlic. Yes. Okay. We will give it a minute mm -hmm. or okay. so. Garlic has started turning brown, Lovely. so we are going to add our tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Please help me with the maize. Lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So give me the beans. Mm -hmm. I want you to look and okay. see where the water is supposed to reach. Okay. And since we had soaked, we want the water mm -hmm. to come and just reach mm -hmm. just above. Mm -hmm. Now we are just going to cover. And that's it. In 40 minutes, we eat. So how safe is it using this cooker? Mm -hmm. So once the contents here come to pressure, mm -hmm. this pin will pop up. Mm -hmm. When that lid is locked and the pin is up, mm -hmm. you cannot open this. Mm -hmm. It just stays in place. Even if it falls, it won't burst open. So it's safe. It's, it's safe, 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 yeah. Whoa, and there's a timer. That was a fast 40 minutes. So now, are we ready to eat? Ah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. The food is ready. I would like to know, the most important thing I would like to know is how much it costed mm. for us to cook using electricity, using the pressure cooker. Okay, so for this meal, what we have consumed so far is uh, we've spent 9 shillings and 49 cents. 9 shillings. Yes. Nine shillings. In a recent test, we discovered that cooking most of your meals with the pressure cooker for a whole week will cost you less than 200 shillings. Dorka spends a thousand shillings every week on firewood for her cooking. That means she could save up to 800 shillings using the pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at our food. Yes, uh, so now that the pin has dropped in, mm. let's open and see how it looks like inside there. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. That is how it looks like. There you go. There you go, Tony. Let me be the first one to taste. Please, I'll tell please. you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <laughs> please be careful. Don't burn. Can I have some more? Yes, please. Don't. Mm. Very, very sweet. Amazing. And the beans. Mm. They are well cooked. Mm. Mm. Ah, Tony. So mm. what smells good here? What's mm. happening? You're just in time for a very nice meal. Mm. It smells good. It is Karim. good. Thank you. Let tell me us just... what you think about our mm. nice meal. Mm, good. Mm. 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 We had a great time here. Yeah. Mm. We enjoyed being in the Ashamba. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Dorcas, I'll be passing by here to eat lots of this. And now we know how to dig. Yeah, of course. We yeah. know how to make the holes. The holes. Mm -hmm. To make more coin. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. So, next time we come, Tony. No, we're going to eat a lot of food mm -hmm. and lots of avocados. Yeah, Agnes, mm -hmm. you've been great. And, Carol? Our work here is done. And so, we'll see you in the next Shamba!